I'm looking at 2 Corinthians, obviously written by the Apostle Paul. It was written from Philippi. If you turn to the back of the book, turn to the back of 2 Corinthians real quick. It says, The second epistle to the Corinthians was written from Philippi, a city of Macedonia, by Titus and Lucas. And as you know, Paul didn't always physically write all of his letters. He's the author, but he would tell some of his buddies what to write, and they would write it. Most likely because of his bad eyesight. But it's written... Somewhere around 57 to 58 A.D. It's got 13 chapters, 257 verses, and around 6,065 words. The theme of 2 Corinthians is the ministry, and the key word is comfort, which is found 14 times in 13 chapters. And... 10% of all times in the Bible you find the word comfort in 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians really shows you the reality of the ministry. You see it in chapter 4, 8 through 10, chapter 11, 14 through 33, chapter 12, 7 through 10. It shows you the reality of ministry is suffering. Resistance, hurt feelings, pressure, stress, misery, physical exhaustion. And here's your quick outline for 2 Corinthians. Chapter 1, a minister suffers with the people. A minister suffers with the people. Chapter 2, you got the forgiving spirit of a minister. The forgiving spirit of a minister. 3, Chapter 3, you got the reality of the ministry. The reality of the ministry. 4, chapter 4, defines your ministry. Chapter 4, it defines your ministry. Chapter 5, you got the perspective of your ministry. And the judgment seat of Christ, the perspective of your ministry. Chapter 6, you got the fellowship of of the minister the fellowship of the minister 8 through 9 the character of the minister 10 the mind of the minister 11 wisdom and understanding of the minister 12 humility of the minister chapter 13 you got Paul's warning and closing to the Corinthians. So with this second epistle of the Corinthians, Paul has sent Titus to Corinth, and he wants to see how they're doing after his first letter that was full of tough love. He's, so he sent Titus to him, and he's he wants to see how they're doing after his first letter. So let's get into chapter 1. Now chapter 1 you're going to see that Paul suffers with the people in chapter 1. Look at verses 8 and 9. Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, he says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who but in God which raiseth the dead. You see, Paul's been through so much trouble that he can't trust in himself. He can't trust in himself, he needs a God. He says that we should not trust in ourselves. And if anybody could trust in themselves, you could you would think it'd be Paul. Look at what all he's been through. Before he was saved, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. After he was saved, he's got all the revelation to the church. It would be easy for him to be exalted above measure and completely trust in himself all the time. 
But God's put him through so much trouble and suffering. That's what the ministry is about. God's put him through so much of that that he can't trust in himself. He has to trust in God. He's not strong enough. He realizes he's he's weak in the flesh. Look at also verses 3 and 6. It says, 3 through 6, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. The same God that puts you through suffering is going to comfort you. It says, Who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. One of the reasons you suffer is so that you can comfort other people who suffer. If God didn't allow you to suffer, then you couldn't allow somebody else who's suffering to become. You couldn't comfort them. He who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God comforts you. That shows you how to comfort somebody else. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Now, notice that salvation there, it's not salvation from hell. Every time you see the word salvation, it does not mean salvation from hell. The salvation here is about their walk. When they see Paul suffering and taking it joyfully, it's going to help their walk as a Christian. This, this is salvation that does not have to do with salvation from heaven and hell. Now look at chapter 2, verses 2 through 7. Verse 7. But in chapter 2, you got the forgiving attitude of a minister. And in this case, Paul's talking about the incest matter, the fornication matter back in 1 Corinthians 5. And Paul's going to show him the forgiving attitude of a minister. Look at verse 7. He says, So that contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. He says, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. You see, you gotta... You, if the person confesses and forsakes the sin, then you gotta receive them and forgive them. And then you gotta comfort them. You gotta show them that you really do forgive them, not... Sh not Holding it over their head. He says to confirm your love toward him. You got to give him assurance that he's forgiven. You see? Don't hold something over somebody's head forever and ever. I know tons of people that you do something bad or somebody does something bad. They're mad at that person forever. They're never going to forget it. They write it down in a book. I know this lady that literally writes down stuff in a book. The bad stuff people have done. And goes back and reads it so she can just keep that grudge or keep that bad thought towards somebody forever. You got to forgive him and comfort him. Lest such a one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. So you restore him. Like Paul says in Galatians. Um, restore each other in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now look at verse 10. He says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. You see, because of Jesus Christ and how he forgave us, we should forgive others. Look at the horrible stuff you've done that nobody even knows about that Jesus Christ forgave you for. If he can forgive you for all the horrible stuff you've done, you should be able to forgive others also. 
you know, one of the devil's devices is to keep you unforgiving and bitter towards somebody. And that's why it says in verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. One of his devices is keeping you bitter and unforgiving. Look at verse 14 through 17. It says, now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Always causeth us to triumph. That's why you're a winner either way. And maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. He says you are the savor of life to some, the savor of death to some. But whatever you are, you you are reminding people of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to a saint, it's refreshing to be around you. It's a refreshing savor. To the lost, it, it's bitter because you're reminding them there's a heaven and a hell. You're reminding them there's a Bible. You're reminding them there's a God. So it's bittersweet. You're sweet and it's it's bitter. That's what that's the way the Word of God is. It's like when John uh, ate that roll over there in Revelation. It made, it was sweet. It tasted sweet, but it made his belly bitter. So. Be a sweet savor. Be a smell of victory. Because like the verse said, verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. All right, now look at chapter 3. And chapter 3 shows you you need to be a walking Bible. Be an open Bible, a walking Bible. Look at verse 2. Paul says, Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You see? You should be a walking, open Bible, an epistle. This is the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians that we're reading. An epistle is a letter. And you need to be an open letter, a walking Bible, to the people that you see every day. And you need to be a sweet savor of life, a sweet savor of death to some. Be, but taking it a step further, people aren't just impressed with what you know. I mean, you can be a walking Bible, go around quoting scripture all day, always ready to give an answer to every man. But people aren't mostly impressed with what you know. They're impressed by how much you care about them. And you need to take it a step further and don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. And in verse 12, he says, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Now, you're a, you're a walking, talking Bible, but are you trying to impress people as a walking, talking Bible? Are you trying to impress them with your words? You don't want to do that because they're not impressed with your words, with, with big, fancy words. So Paul uses great plainness of speech he says and not as moses which put a veil over his face that the children of israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished you know when you get up saying all these fancy words you're putting a veil over your face you're making it hard to get the lord's got this where he wants you to understand it he's not the author of confusion he wants to show you something out of his word now, Moses, to Israel, he, uh, he had a veil over his face to a lot of them. They still don't get it to this day. It says in verse 14, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. You see, when those Jews, even today, they look at the Old Testament, they can't see the Lord Jesus Christ in that. They got that same veil over their face. But it says the veil is done away in Christ. When you go around 
uh, and you uh, got the Bible and you're you using these big fancy words and you're using taking everybody to the Greek, the common man, you're putting a veil over your face. You're a walking, talking Bible. You are an epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. But people aren't impressed with all this fancy stuff you know. They're impressed with how much you care, and they're impressed with if you can just open the Bible and break it down for them so that they can understand it. It says in verse 15, But even in this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. You see, when Israel turns to the Lord at the second coming, the veil is going to be taken away. And Moses' veil is a figure of Israel's blindness to Jesus Christ. But when you as a Christian, as a walking, talking Bible, you get up and don't you don't use that great plainness of speech as Paul does, you're just putting a veil over your face. Look at chapter 4. Chapter 4 shows you negative truths about the ministry. It shows you the devil you're going to be fighting. It says in verse 4, And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That's the devil you're fighting in the ministry the God of this world that's blinded the minds of the people that you're ministering to. He doesn't want the glorious gospel of Christ to shine unto the people. And if you're a open Bible, he's wanting to close you real quick. Look at verse 5. It says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. See, Paul's preaching Jesus Christ, not himself. You know, don't make every illustration about you when you're preaching. Jesus Christ should be the center of every message. Uh, and preachers are there to serve and feed the sheep because it's for Jesus' sake. Ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Preach not yourself. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. When you make every illustration about you, you're making it about you. Look at verse 8 through 12. He says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. See, you're an open Bible for Jesus. You're suffering for Jesus. You... The life of Jesus is made manifest in your mortal body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall also Shall raise, shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving, thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. But you see all those things that Paul's suffering in the ministry. You know, you get the idea by these TV preachers, it's all about living comfortably in prosperity, millions of dollars, Private jets, fancy suits, looking good, smelling good, hair slicked back. You know, hands never getting dirty. That's the idea that they give you. Even a lot of small timers, small time preachers, I'll give that ones that that ain't making millions. They they they'll give you that idea, but Paul's giving you the idea. The ministry is about suffering. It's negative truths about the ministry in chapter 4. But you look at 17 through 18, he puts you in the uh, perspective again. He says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, 
worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. These are light afflictions. He says, you're going through, you're going to go through afflictions. You're going to go through suffering. But compared to eternity, this is light afflictions. And he says in verse 18, while we look not at the thing, at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. See, these are temporal things. The suffering's temporal. And that's maybe what you're seeing right now. But there's things on the other side that you can't see, and that's what's eternal. Now, chapter 5. Chapter 5 is going to show you two different tabernacles. Look at 5, verse 2. He says, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. You see, you're in this body down here, this tabernacle. And if you realize you're saved, if you if you have been saved and you realize that you're saved and, and you got the rapture ahead of you, you just can't wait to get that glorified body. And so you groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with your, with your house, which is from heaven. And it, he says, if so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. And in Revelation 3.18 and Revelation 19.8, it talks about you don't want to be found naked. And that has to do with the per, your personal righteousness that you have here. Not you, Your personal righteousness can't get you salvation, but it can get you something at the judgment seat of Christ. Your personal righteousness gives you your clothes at the judgment seat of Christ. It'll give you clothes for that new body. So you want to be living right. You want to try your best to live for the Lord. It says in... 6 through 8. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. When you're in this earthly tabernacle down here, you're absent from the Lord. But it says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather not to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He wants to be out of this tabernacle and present with the Lord. Look at 10 through 11. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And when you do that, you don't want to be found naked. He says that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You see, you're going you're gonna to give account for the things done in this tabernacle down here. So Paul says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord would persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So he says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men. The terror of the Lord. It's going to be a fearful thing at the judgment seat of Christ. Now look at chapter 6. In chapter 6, it talks about approving yourselves as the ministers of God. And Paul has definitely done that. He says in verse 3, "...giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God." He says, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, that's not fake love, that's not hypocritical or pretend love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we love, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, 
as having nothing and yet possessing all things. You see, the Christian life is a paradox. It seems one way, but it's really another way. You see, as poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing and yet possessing all things. Poor physically, maybe, but rich spiritually. O ye Corinthians, our heart is enlarged unto you. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in our bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. And he goes on to talk about, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he, he, he's wrote to him in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, he said. But not all together with the fornicators of the world, because then they'd go... They'd need to go out of the world to do that. You can't go out of the world. But he tells them, don't be une unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Then you get over in chapter 7. And chapter 7, Paul gets has got a, talks about how he gets a good report from Titus. And he rests unashamed in his boasting of them. You see, he's been boasting of the Corinthians. And he he's unashamed in that boasting because... He's got a good report from Titus. He says in 7 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You see, when it comes to your soul, you're clean and spotless. And you got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When it comes to your flesh, you're not clean. You gotta you gotta Every day, daily, 1 John 1, 9, confess your sins. If we confess our sins, he's able and just forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse yourself of your drunkenness, fornication, adultery, lying, stealing, envy, etc. When it comes to the spirit, to cleanse the spirit of the envy and the bitterness and the self-righteousness and the covetousness and the, and the wrath. You know, you're perfecting it. You're not going to be sinless in this body, but... You, you want to be complete. You want to perfect it. And then get down to verse 6 and 7. He says, Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. You see, Titus comforted Paul, comforted Paul by letting him know how good the Corinthians were doing. And you get over to chapter 8, and it's about um, giving in love. And he talks, he commends the Macedonians and, and their church on their giving. Look at verse 1 through 5. He says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how then a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and by beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. You see, they gave themselves unto the Lord. You know, giving is more than giving money. It's giving your time. It's presenting your body a living sacrifice to the Lord. You know, there's a lot of people that give a lot of money on Sunday. But are they giving themselves to the Lord? If you're giving yourself to the Lord, it's a daily thing. It's where you die daily. You reckon yourself dead daily. You die daily. You give yourself to the Lord. You present your body a living sacrifice. You know, there's a lot of people that, when it comes to money, they don't care to just throw it, throw it out there. But they're not going to give themselves. They're not going to present their body a living sacrifice to the Lord, you see. Look at verse 9. It says, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, 
Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ did? He didn't come down and give a bunch of money. He presented himself a sacrifice for you and for me. He he was rich. He he owned the cattle of a thousand hills, but he became came down here and became poor. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He said, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He became poor, but he presented his body a living sacrifice and made you able to be rich. Made you be able to believe on him, get his imputed righteousness to be saved, and then one day you're going to be rich with him in eternity. Look at verse 21. It says, Providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Providing things honest in the sight of men. You know, you want to, you don't want people to think you're like a lot of uh, Christians out there that's just all about trickery and manipulation and extortion when it comes to the giving. You're providing things honest in the sight of men, abstaining from all appearance of evil. You know, make sure people know you aren't all about the money. That it's it's beyond that. It goes it goes. This is way bigger than money. What we're doing here. Now, chapter nine. In chapter nine, he talks about ministering to the saints. It says, "For us touching ministering to the saints, it is uh, superfluous for me to write to you." That means it's not superfluous. Means not necessary. You see, sometimes you're going to teach things that may even seem unnecessary. And Paul says it's superfluous for me to write to you. He says in verse 3 through 4, Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain on this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. Lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. So he's sending somebody over there because... If somebody comes with Paul of Macedonia, he doesn't want them to be unprepared and then him be ashamed about all this bragging he's been doing on them. Look at verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So that is how you give. It's not of necessity, not grudgingly, but cheerfully. That's how you should give. Now look at chapter 10. In chapter 10, it talks about the spiritual weapons of a Bible-believing minister in chapter 10. He, and he, Paul says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. You see, in these letters, he's very bold and might come off a little rough, but in in his presence, he's meek and gentle and base. That's because that's that's who he wants to be. He wants to be meek and gentle. He doesn't want to be be all be all uh, rough and stuff face to face. That's why he's got to write these letters so bold and rough like. That way, you the the Corinthians will straighten up before he gets there. See, he's using, he's using his words, these epistles, and these epistles happen to be the Word of God. That's what he's using as a weapon to soften them up, to get them humbled up. And that's what the Bible will do to you. It's a spiritual weapon, and it'll humble you up. It'll, be, it'll beat you up a little bit, get you softened up. So Paul's, Paul is bold in his letters so that he doesn't have to be bold when he gets face to face. And he says in verse 3, for, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after, after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of this world. We got a spiritual weapon. It's the 
The word of God is the sword, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12. You see, this is a spiritual war with spiritual weapons. Look down at verse 9 and 10. He says, That I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters, see, this is what the false teachers are going to say about him, undermining him. They say, For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. You know, some people, it's like they only want to listen to preachers that get up and are just, just, just rough and, and, um, and loud speaking all the time. And that's all they want to hear. And, they, and so they probably thought, well, pa Paul, he's going to, they'll say, well, he, he talks so rough and tough in these letters and he's going to be a, a big rough preacher, get up here, just bless everybody out. But then you see him and his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So maybe he stutters. Maybe struggles a little bit. Maybe loses his train of thought. You see, that doesn't mean he's not called of God. Because obviously, it's the Apostle Paul we're talking about. He's called of God. But his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. It's not all about how smooth you are talking. It's not all about how rough you are and how tough you are. Paul's bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible, but he was obviously called of God. He he was he got the revelation from Jesus Christ himself. But look what he says in verse eleven. It says, "Let such an one think this: that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we're present." You know, if they don't. If they don't take heed to the epistles and straighten up, then he will be bold when he's presently with them. Now look at verse 11. And in verse 11, it gets into Paul's credentials. And Paul will match his credentials with all these smart aleck critics going around talking trash about him. And he says, for I am, in verse 2, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. See, there is a godly jealousy. Uh, Elijah said, I'm very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. You know, all those prophets of Baal, all those people worship, worshiping Baal. And Elijah got very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. I get very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Sometimes, like, I've been at, like, one of the kids' games or something. You know, everybody will stand up and... Re uh, in reverence to the flag, do the anthem and whatnot, and take their hat off and everything, and that's great. They ought to. But it's like, when's the last time you gave that much reverence to God himself and God alone? And the, the flag and none of that having nothing to do with it. You just see the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's done for you, and you should be in awe and in reverence of him. When's the last time you did that for the Bible? You see, Paul is very jealous over them with godly jealousy. He says, For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You know, he doesn't want them to be defiled by these false teachers and by the devil. He wants them to present them a chaste virgin to Christ. He says, But I fear, lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. You know, Satan uses subtlety to bring corruption. He's subtle. Just like these false teachers with their fair speeches and their big time bodily presence. Verse 21. Now you're going to see Paul lay out his credentials. Verse 21 through 33. He says, I speak as concerning reproach as though he had been weak, albeit wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. He says, I speak foolishly because he's given his own credentials here. And Paul's not the type of guy that wants to go around saying good stuff about himself or bragging on himself. 
He's feeling that he has to because the Corinthians are so impressed with these false ministers with all their fancy credentials. So he says, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Because carnal people care what ethnicity you are. You see, sometimes uh, they're, they're so concerned with what, et, et, what, what race you are. But what does the Lord, what does Paul say? In, in Jesus Christ, you're neither Jew nor Greek, you're neither bond nor free, you're neither men nor female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. It don't matter if he's black, it don't matter if he's white, it don't matter if he's Asian, it doesn't matter if he's a Jew. But people get so caught up in that. So he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, and journeyings often, and perils of waters, and perils of waters, and perils by my own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, and weariness and painfulness, and watchings often, and hunger and thirst, and fastings often, and cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. See, he's going through all this stuff, getting beat, and he's still got the care of all the churches. He says, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. And Damascus, the governor under Eretus, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with the garrison, desirous to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. You see, he's went through all this stuff. He's got the credentials. He's got more credentials. He's been through the trenches much more than all these false ministers that the Corinthians are so impressed by. Paul's the one they should be impressed with. But specifically, the God in him is who they need to be impressed with. Now we get into chapter 12 and Paul's given even more credentials and he's telling them about his trip to the third heaven. And he says in verse 1, it says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. That's one of the things that hints that this is him who he's talking about. Because he says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And he says, I knew a man in Christ. I believe he's talking about himself. He said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago where they're in the body I cannot tell or where they're out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. I, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. You see, um, look at in verse 2 through 4. He, he, Paul got some revelations even that weren't lawful to utter. He's got some stuff, some hidden knowledge up in that brain that he ain't even allowed to tell them about. How's that for some credentials? And he was probably, this probably happened at his stoning over there in Acts 14, 19, where he died, and he was up there in the third heaven, and then the Lord had him come back down. And he's he's mentioning this after he give, gave all those credentials. He's like, you're talking to somebody that's been to the third heaven and back. Have your false ministers been to the third heaven and back and got all this stuff that they can't even tell you about because it's too good? The Lord wouldn't even let me tell you about it. And in verse 7, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. 
Paul had so much going for him that the Lord had to give him a messenger of Satan to buffet him, a thorn in the flesh. See, he'd been to the third heaven and had all these revelations. It would be easy to get puffed up in that. But Paul is not puffed up like the false ministers the Corinthians love and adore. Now, chapter 13, you get into Paul's closing words and his, his final warning to the Corinthians. He says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. He says, I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. He's saying if they ain't got this thing worked out, if they ain't got this stuff worked out when he gets there, he's not going to be meek and gentle. He's going to be bold towards them just like he is in these letters. He says in verse 7, I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. He said, you know, he isn't worried about them doing good for his own reputation. His motive is for their growth. He says in verse 10, Therefore I write these things being absent. See, he's writing these letters while he's not with them, lest being present, I should use sharpness. He doesn't want to have to use sharpness when he gets there. He just wants to come in fellowship. According to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. He says, Finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. So that is Second Corinthians.